my name is Jack Nelson. I'm with Master Window Cleaners of America, and we're here in uh, Livermore, California. We're doing a seminar on hard water spot removal with uh, Fields Construction Services, and I'd like to introduce Dan Fields. Thank you. This seminar is going to be on uh, hard water spots and hard water spot removal. Uh, the information we're going to be given here is going to be pretty broad, but I want to touch base on uh, the removal of hard water spots, some chemicals that are being used out there uh, to try to resolve the problem, and some of the reactions that uh, we are getting uh, from uh, the chemicals we use on the hard water spots. The first thing I'd like to touch base on is the composition of hard water spots. Uh, usually hard water spots are categorized in two different categories. Uh, the first category being magnesium and calcium, which is usually doesn't present a whole lot of problem uh, getting off glass. Uh, usually a phosphoric acid will take care of it. But when you have a problem where water, hard water spots cannot be removed, it usually has something to do with a different type of water spot. And that's what I'd like to discuss here today. That type of water spot is, is composed of silicate. The source of silicate on a lot of these water spots comes from two main areas. One area is building rundown off of precast concrete, which the silicate from the concrete does run down from the concrete onto the glass, dries on the glass, and actually attaches itself to the glass. The second, the second source of the hard water spots is sprinkler systems. A lot of the, the sprinkler systems are being shot onto the windows and uh, sometimes there's silicate in it, sometimes there's uh, magnesium or calcium, which usually doesn't present a problem. To get the silicate off of uh, glass that has uh, that type of water spot, there's only two methods that you can use uh, to attempt to get that done. The one method is by using an acid, uh, using an HF, hydrofluoric acid, or a product that might have hydrofluoric acid in it. And the second way to do it would be to use a, a polishing system to where you could use a, a polisher and actually braid the, the uh, water spots off the glass. The silicate water spots that we're talking about actually attach themselves to the glass and they have no effect using other acids. The only acid that we can use is uh, the hydrofluoric. And the reason the hydrofluoric works is because hydrofluoric does dissolve glass. And this silicate deposit is actually a glass silicate. It, it's made of the same thing the glass is made of. All float glass in the United States is made of roughly 72 to 75 percent silica. So it actually does attach itself to the glass and once it's attached uh, it's very hard to remove. Uh, before we get into different options as far as uh, what we can do as far as the acids or braiding, uh, I'd like to describe a little bit on the different manufacturing techni techniques of glass. If we're going to try to get water spots off of glass, I think we need to know a little bit more about the substrate that we're re removing uh, the water spots from. Originally, when glass was first uh, invented, they came out with what they call a crown glass. Uh, crown glass was uh, well before World War I, and it's actually uh, glass they mixed up, heated it up in globs. They, they actually pulled it out of a, of a tank that they heated it up in the sand, put it on a fulcrum, and actually spun it, and the glass flattened out into s small little round circles. And a lot of the older churches you see, you'll see crown glass uh, that they made windows out of. And they actually take the small pieces of glass and they let it together and make, make big windows out of it. But uh, crown glass is something that, is, that is, uh, w was one of the first materials they used for uh, windows. And since then they, they uh, have developed uh, cylinder glass, which is right before World War I. Cylinder glass, they actually made glass in, in, in a type of cylinder shape a 40-foot cylinder, and they'd make it in a cylinder shape, and then when they, to, to make a flat piece of glass out of it, they would scribe the side of the cylinder and heat, reheat it, and then open it up with wooden, wooden poles and make flat glass out of it. And like I say, this was prior to World War II, so we're just learning how to make glass and 
especially flat glass. After World War II, they came out with sheet glass. And sheet glass was actually made in, in large float tanks and was actually uh, pulled up from pu float tanks it, it, into scaffolds in the air. And they actually pulled it up two or three stories, four stories, up in the plant where they actually got it high enough in the plant where it cooled. They cut it and packed it and shipped it out. That was uh, sheet glass, and they don't, they don't manufacture that anymore here in the United States either. Uh, they do in some places overseas, but uh, the United States they don't. Uh, plate glass is, is what they had around the 1950s, and plate glass was something they used where they had they heated up the glass, they had it come out on tables. It, it wasn't very clear, so they did have to grind and polish the glass into a clear surface. So that, that, that was uh, what they call plate. So lots of times when window cleaners talk about, I'm going to go clean that plate glass, or I'm going to go clean that a different type of glass. Really, glass is, more, glass is pretty much glass, and it's just they call it these different names by letting you uh, know exactly how it was manufactured. And I don't want to go into too much detail on any of these. Uh, that's not what the seminar is about. But I felt it was important to have a rough understanding of where we got to where we are today. And right now, all manufacturers manufacture float glass. And that's the, the method that, that they use to manufacture glass. And the reason I bring that up is because, because if all the glass is float glass, why is it sometimes that when we try to clean water spots off of glass, why is it sometimes it, it does a, a wonderful job, even silicates, we use HF on silicates or products with HF, and it takes the silicates right off, does a great job because it dissolves the silicate, and it doesn't do any damage at all. And then there's other times we'll try the exact same thing, and it actually leaves an etching on the surface of the glass. And people have tried to figure out what causes that. I've heard a lot of different explanations on it. And I've heard that, well, it's stage one corrosion, and the glass was actually corroded. And when you use HF on it, it's just exposed that corrosion, which is not the fact. The reason HF does give a tin uh, etch haze, which is what they call it, is because you're trying to use an HF on the tin side of the glass. And since all glass nowadays is float glass, it has tin on one side of the glass and it has nothing on the other side of the glass. When they manufacture this glass, they actually float it on molten tin. So, so they, they, they batch it up, heat it up, it goes to the float tank. As it comes out of the float tank, it's actually floating on, on molten tin in the float tank. So when it comes out of there, you have 25 to 30 milligrams of tin on that glass. And it's so thin you can't see it. If you use uh, hydrofluoric acid or a product with hydrofluoric acid in it, you have a good possibility of getting tin etch haze. And that is caused by the reaction of that acid on that tin. You can try the exact same acid on the opposite side of the glass, and, and you won't get any reaction at all. And uh, we'll have some slides later that, that I'll show on this that actually shows uh, the, the, this piece of glass we actually took pictures of. And I actually used a UV lamp, and that's how you can tell if it's float glass or not. If you take a UV lamp and shine it on one side of the glass, and we'll do this demonstration, it, you'll get a grayish reflection. And if you shine it on the air side of the glass, you'll get a clear, crisp reflection. And this shows up much more on tinted glass than it does on clear glass. It still shows up on, on the glass, but, but it's harder to see. And if you do it outside in the bright sun, it's even harder to see. But if you use the, the uh, hydrofluoric acid on this uh, surface, it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens often enough to where it really creates a problem. And, and up to now, a lot of people think it's corrosion, and actually it has nothing to do with corrosion. Uh, uh, stage one corrosion is something that is invisible. You can't even see it. The only way you can see stage one corrosion, you can't even see it in the microscope. The only way you can see stage one corrosion is by moisture. If, if you take a steam iron, take a perfectly clean piece of glass and shoot it with a steam iron, you'll see different things that happen to that glass. You'll see suction cup marks, different things, the, the actual chemistry, surface chemistry of that glass, you'll be able to see it. But once it dries up, it's gone. So stage one corrosion has absolutely nothing to do with, with uh, this etching that some of you window cleaners are getting. I've also heard, this, well, if it's not stage one corrosion, it must be stage two corrosion. 
Stage two corrosion uh, is not the case either because it takes certain uh, things to happen to get stage two corrosion. The only way stage two corrosion, surface corrosion, can, can happen to flat glass is, is it has to get corroded by moisture. And the only way it can be uh, corroded by moisture, it, it requires three things, time, temperature, and a stagnant environment. The outside of the building, it, it, it has way too much uh, air to dry out the, the water, or if it rains, it, it just will not happen on that. Where you will see glass corrosion is, is in two main areas. One area will be on an IG unit. If you have a, a seal fail on an IG unit, what will happen is moisture will get in between the, the glass and it will actually corrode the glass. In fact, I have a sample here that I will show. This here is actually true glass corrosion. And we'll have some photos of this also. But actual glass corrosion is actually corroding the surface of glass. This is moisture-induced glass corrosion. And for this to happen, you have to have the moisture, you have to have a stagnant environment, and you have to have uh, time. Uh, or, yeah, time. Without that, you cannot get glass corrosion. That's why all of our windows on our buildings do not corrode, because you don't have that. It happens to this unit because the seals were broke. This I actually took out of my building here because it was such a good sample. And I told him, put, put a new window and I want this window. The landlord loved it. But uh, it happened to this window because moisture got in between the glass and it was a very small amount of moisture. And with a small amount of moisture, what happens is the moisture has positive and negative ions. And I don't want to get too technical about this, but glass being a consumer, the glass does consume the positive ions and it does give back negative ions, which makes the pH in the solution go higher. And when the pH goes high enough in that very small uh, moisture solution, it will corrode the glass. But anyway, that's, that's one way you can corrode glass. The other way uh, glass corrosion happens is with uh, glass manufacturers when they're storing glass. They'll take sheets of glass and just stack sheet after sheet after sheet after sheet. If there's any moisture between them sheets, the exact same thing will happen. The, the, the moisture will, the pH in that moisture will build up and will rise. And when the pH gets high enough, it will actually corrode the glass. So it's the pH that's actually doing the corroding, not anything else. It has, it has nothing to do with, with uh, anything else that's happening. And, and the, 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 the uh, Hydrofluoric acid will not show up on corrosion. It has nothing to do with corrosion, but I, I just wanted to point that out. The, the biggest thing I wanted to bring to this seminar is for you guys that are doing spot removal, uh, I, I suggest you use only polishing methods uh, so you don't run into this. If you choose to use hydrofluoric acid or products with that, you just need to take some precautions. Some of them precautions are health precautions. M make sure you have the proper gear the gloves, the goggles, the whole nine yards, I personally, it's too much of a risk for me. And beyond that, you, you need to check your glass to be able to identify what side are we working with. So I, I suggest you get a, a UV lamp, preferably battery operated so you, so you don't have to carry around a plug, and shine it on the glass. And if it has a grayish reflection, you know that's the tin side. So that pretty well takes you out of the, out of the possibility of using HF, unless you want to take a chance of, of uh, getting 10 inch haze. If you have a clear reflection, then you can go ahead and use it and feel pretty confident you can be able to take the silicate deposits out and not have the 10 etch a problem. There's also uh, one thing you got to be careful of. Uh, I, I have never seen a corrosion like you see on this window here. I have never seen that on the tin side of glass. Usually when you have corrosion on glass, you will only have it on the air side. You'll never have it on the tin side. For some reason, the tin protects the glass from corroding. Uh, both of these inside panes here, I, I tested with the UV lamp earlier, and both inside panes are on the air side. And when I pulled that apart, they were both corroded. But a lot of IG units, if you look at them close, only one pane is corroded and the other one's not. That's because one of them, the, the, the tin surface is facing out. And if you take a UV lamp, you can test it and it'll confirm that. Usually you will not get corrosion on the tin side of the glass. So on flow glass, you have a tin side and an air side. So, so you, you will not get any corrosion 
I'm kind of mixing up two things here, to, to talking about corrosion and talking about silicate deposits. But the reason I bring corrosion into this conversation is because a, a lot of manufacturers that, that do sell products, they're saying the reason this thing etches is it, it, because it was corroded and it just exposes the corrosion. And it really has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the tin side of the glass and that's the reason it's happening. You can take a brand new piece of glass right from the float manufacturer and do the exact same thing. Now how can that glass be corroded? It's brand new. So, so that is not the fact. Also, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, pyrolytic coatings, the silver coatings. The silver coatings are actually uh, set up to where they are on usually the top side of the glass when it's manufactured because it's put on during the float process. So, so when, that, when that glass goes into a building, you know that the tin side is opposite that silver because it was floating on the tin when it came out of the tank. So, so if you're looking at a, a tin coating or a, a pyrolytic coating, say, on a building, if the pyrolytic coating is on surface one, you can't use HF because the pyrolytic coating is so thin, if you use HF on it, you'll cook it. So you can't use HF because of the, tin, because of the pyrolytic coating. If the pyrolytic coating is on surface number two, you still can't use HF on this because this surface here was the side that was in contact with the tin when that glass was manufactured. So anytime you run into any type of pyrolytic coatings, you can't use hydrofluoric acid at all. That's not an option. That's not an option for them reasons. You can't use it on the coating and you can't use it on the tin side. So on that piece of glass, there isn't much you can do except use a polishing method, so some type of polishing system. And you can only use the polishing system if that pyrolytic coating is on surface number two. If that pyrolytic coating is on surface number one and that silicate's on surface number one, there isn't much you can do. Because you don't want to use that polisher on that, on that pyrolytic coating either. Because you'll take that coating right off. So be very careful with the pyrolytic coatings. And they show up a lot more on pyrolytic coatings. But some, some tin etch haze shows up a lot more than others. This one here I actually did and I wrote uh, tin side with a sponge with the hydrofluoric acid and I'm sure it's not going to show here but it's along the top but we will see some in our images and I actually took microscopic images of what tin etch haze looks like and what water spots looks like and what corrosion looks like. None of them look alike. They're completely different. So when someone says that tin etch haze is corrosion, it just, the, the HF just exposed the corrosion, it doesn't look anything like corrosion. Tin etch haze looks completely different. And corrosion actually eats the surface of the glass. It actually cracks this, the glass into little pieces. I mean, it, 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 like I say, we'll, we'll see the, uh, the images and you'll see the difference. There's a major difference between them. Okay? Is there any questions on this? If, uh, one last thing, if uh, you use, I don't know if I had mentioned this, but if you, if you use uh, HF on other glass, like on older houses that may have the crown glass, which it won't be crown probably, but uh, the other types of glass from years ago that aren't float, sure, you, you, have a, you have a good chance of success. But it's just the float glass, which is all the newer glass, and, and the float process was started back in the uh, late 50s. I think it was 1959, the Pilkington started doing float glass and the United States picked it up from there. So anything from about 1960 on, be very leery. And make sure your customers know. It's kind of like we said before on a temper glass clause. Make sure you get your clause signed. If the guy says do it anyway, well that's fine, but make sure he knows if you get 10 inch haze, you're not going to be responsible. And I would get the UV light, especially if you're doing much of this, so you can show your customer. And in the literature you have, you can show them the literature. <laughs>